On the morning of August 1, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. I'm Sarah Ferris, true crime podcaster. And I'm Catherine Schweit, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And you're listening to Stop the Killing. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Stop the Killing. I am super excited, super excited to talk to our guest today, who is a friend of mine, but somebody who you will want to get to know because of the knowledge base that he brings to the table on a subject that is particularly interesting to people who have kids in schools. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me first and foremost. So I'm Chris Joffe, the founder and CEO of an organization called Joffe Emergency Services. And I guess to to try to put it all into a small you know bucket of information. <laughs> yeah, or... yeah, one sentence, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So we started our organization about 15 years ago to make communities safer. And today we work in about 34 states around the U.S. through about 500 employees to do just that in schools and in a few event centers as well. So Chris, I've known for a while, we ran into each other and then became friends. And full disclosure, I work with Jaffe Emergency Services just in an advisory role occasionally. And he's modest in his statement. He's really very mission oriented. And when you talk to Chris and you start talking to him about things, you begin to hear how passionate he is. And I should uh, add a little caveat here that we're missing Sarah today. We're not missing her. She's busy running other errands for me. I think I sent her out for a grocery run and I'm not sure when she's coming back. So we'll press on without her. So Chris, the name of the company itself, can, can you tell me your background, which will help to explain, first of all, how the organization got the name that it does have. Yeah. So I'll go, I, I guess I'll go all the way back to the beginning here because it helps to lay the foundation. So right. I was born as the fifth child to a sex worker in St. Louis, Missouri. We were all removed from the home at some point of uh, our early years and placed into different places, uh, foster care, orphanages, uh, friends, family, et cetera. And to make a long story short, I you know I was lucky enough to be placed in all of those and um, spent some time in particular in a foster home where another child was killed. And you know I, it was early in life. I don't remember much of it, and it's fascinating to listen to people like Bruce Perry explain the ways in which those early memories create who we are. But regardless, so I then, you know, get adopted, um, live an incredible life. I, I feel really fortunate to have been adopted by my mom. And I find my way as I was starting to figure out what I was going to do post high school into an EMT class. I really found myself thriving and loving that environment. And so uh, I started a career in EMS. Uh, I started working alongside the fire service in Southern California and then thought I was I would like go towards this really traditional career, try to become a, a career firefighter paramedic. And I, I had this whole plan. And then on the side, I started doing CPR and first aid training. And I started training schools just honestly by mistake. And I had this really sort of aha moment where one of the schools I was training, they came back to me the second year. And Mindy is the, the name of the person who did this, came back and said, I used the skills that you trained us on last year to save my son. And I was Floored. And so just the level of engagement and enthusiasm and the fact that she had been able to take something that we had taught and do something with it was massively motivating. And so around that same time, the school started to say, can you help us do more? Can you help us with our fire drills? Can you help us with our earthquake drills? Can you help us with our lockdown drills? And so we we started doing just that. And what I discovered was that this like sort of early years trauma, perspective, all that jazz created this passion for me to take people's fear away or to at least work to manage fear and try to help them become more useful and more active during an emergency. And then I never looked back. And somehow over the course of the last decade and change, the organization has grown to where it is today. So when when it's called Jothy Emergency Services, it really comes maybe from your base of being an EMS. And the idea that you want to just be there to help people from an emergency standpoint, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's that. And maybe I lacked creativity too. (laughs) (laughs) Chris, you have a book coming out, right? I do. All clear lessons from a decade managing school crises. So lessons from a decade of managing school crises. So this is the fun part for me because usually I get called because people want me to come and talk about what I've learned about school crises. And now I get to quiz you about what you've learned about school crises. Surprise! Because I didn't actually tell Chris what I wanted him to talk about. I just told him I wanted him to come on. So now you can hang up if you want, Chris. But if not, we'll four done. All right. All right. I love it. So just uh, the name of your book, what's the beginning of it? All Clear. All Clear. The name of his book is All Clear. So when you're going to look it up on Amazon, the name of the book is All Clear. So it's Chris uh, Joffe, J-O-F-F-E. So Chris, first of all, like, why did you decide to write this book? Because you don't work just in schools, right? Yes, we serve communities. Right now, that means schools and events. And so they have this thing in common that I think people don't think about all that often. We have kind of a static population, our employees, and then we have (laughs) a more transient population, our students or our guests. And the expectation is that the static population cares for the transient population in both of those environments. And arguably that exists everywhere, but it's really clear and palpable in those two areas. And so that's where we choose to focus today. And I hope to be able to add to that over the next decade or two. So when school administrators and teachers are thinking about their clientele, it's the students who they're with every day, but it's also the parents right? If school administrators have to think about their faculty and the students they have to care for, but then the school administrators and and superintendents also have to think about the parents who are coming on scene to a football game or a basketball game, who are coming in for parent-teacher conferences for band concerts and choral uh, performances. That's what you mean? Absolutely. Or worse, even more challenging, I should say, when parents show up to pick up their kids after an emergency has happened. And so parents are there to do reunification and maybe haven't been prepared to do that. Maybe haven't practiced that yet. And so suddenly you have this population of really concerned parents, right? All of our parental instincts are taking hold and we're trying to manage them and tell them what to do and set expectations. I it can be a really scary experience if we're not sort of proactive around it and about it. So just keeping on that one thought, tell me one or two things that a school can do that will help them through that particular crisis, matching students to parents. Yes. I mean, to me, there's like the inflection point that says, yes, you're a safe enough school that you have the tools, you have the strategies, you can manage so much more than just reunification because it's a scaffolding process. The first thing I would suggest is right now, like take out your pen and schedule a reunification drill for next spring. Depending on when you're listening to this, right? We're we're filming this in in the the winter of 23. And so if you're, you know, talking about right this second, then great, schedule it for spring of 25. If you're listening to this later, give yourself 12 to 18 months to plan for your first drill and just get it on the calendar. Getting it on the calendar will force you to backwards plan into what you need to do in order to make it successful. It'll force you to send out your parent education strategy, whether that's videos or emails or doing a parent education session at school or all of the above. I would argue that that's the best. Doing that will force you into getting your your staff and faculty education going. And so scheduling the, the PD time in staff and faculty meetings, and then it will also kind of subconsciously change the impact of the drills that you're doing day in and day out. So every school is doing some version of drills, probably every month, in some cases, multiple times per month. And so scheduling a reunification drill makes those drills meaningful because you now start to see and understand what the next step is. And so you you move beyond, okay, we've evacuated, everybody's out of the building, we took attendance, we accounted for everyone, great, which is, by the way, excellent, you've got to start there. But you move into the like real value proposition of the drill, which is we're going to ultimately, our, our basic commitment as schools is that at the end of the day, we're going to give back our kids, right? Between the time parents drop them off and the time that we release them, maybe we'll educate them, maybe we'll feed them, maybe we'll create social relationships, right? Maybe we'll do all sorts of other things. But at the end of the day, our, our basic commitment is to give kids back to their families. And so you're challenging yourself to kind of set the foundation to do that, even on some of the worst days that you might face. So that's maybe the first action. The second, I would say, 
is start to engage families. I mean, Kate, you called this out a second ago, right? We're so good at talking to students. We're so good at talking to teachers, even as schools. I would say that talking to parents has some room for improvement in general. That was very diplomatic. That was a very diplomatic note to staff. (laughs) I mean, I use the Brene Brown uh, methodology, which is in the absence of data, we all make up stories. And what we've added to that is, so start dialogue. We often find ourselves, when it comes to parents, afraid to talk to parents, afraid to tell them that we're going to do this reunification drill, because then they might know that the world is a little bit scary. Right. Great. Let's let's do it. Let's build confidence. Let's do it in a way that builds confidence. And let's kind of relieve ourselves of the pressure of informing them of the concerns of the world. I like to assume that they're watching the news just like we are, right? They know the concerns of the world. They probably have a greater sense of the concern than we do and a magnified sense as it relates to their kids than we do. And so let's start communicating and let's start communicating in a way that creates data, eliminates the stories that they may be making up, and most importantly, builds confidence so that when they need to show up, that they have confidence, not just in themselves, but in us to do what needs to be done to get their kids back to them. The heart of what we're trying to do does have to do with kids and parents when it comes to schools themselves. Parents are the missing link in school safety. You don't know what your kids are learning. You don't reinforce it once the kids are home. You don't help them anticipate what might be coming. So schools can provide all of that kind of information if they are prepared to open the door and shed a little light on what safety is all about. And I think what you said is so spot on. There are so many parents who say, that's scary. I don't want to talk about it with my kids. And, you know, the schools don't have that luxury, just like law enforcement doesn't. You don't have that luxury. It's part of the deal. And even just to illustrate that sort of challenge of what happens if we leave parents out or or even what the benefit is of bringing parents in, I think of, you know, we do lockdown, right? We do earthquake, we do hurricane, we sort of all hazards, right? That's the, the technical term for our work. But I think the moment that a student's in lockdown, And this is a conversation that we have with so many schools. I mean, frankly, probably at least once a week, I have this conversation directly. Yeah. And, you know, we go into lockdown and the question comes up, what do we do about kids' cell phones? I just had this conversation with people. (laughs) I know where you're going. I just had this conversation. (laughs) Yeah. And I was So I was in Canada last month talking to a group of schools and they said, we actually take our kids' phones away at the beginning of the day. And I was like, sure, sure. Like I've heard that in the US too. And they were like, no, 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 we actually take them away. So maybe it's different in different parts of the world. But what I'll say is that here, generally speaking, across the US, kids have their phones with them and they're going to text their parents and they're going to text their parents the version of the story that they perceive to be happening. And I can almost guarantee that that's going to be worse than the situation that we're actually facing. Right. More often than we go into lockdown because of an active shooter or the really scary stuff, we go into lockdown because of a police chase that's near campus or because of something that's potentially going to happen on or around campus. And so far more often, to the tune of thousands more times per year, we go into lockdown for something that will never pose a direct threat to our students. And yet, of course, because of what we've all seen on the news, because of the kind of societal trauma we've endured, a student's perspective is that this is this you know, enormous and and life altering, if not life ending moment. And that's the text that goes to families. Right. And what I would argue is like we have an opportunity proactively. Again, this only works if we engage parents up front to actually tell our parents what we want them to say to their kids. I'm here right. for you. You can text me, but I need you to be quiet. I need you to listen to the directions that your teacher is providing for you. I need you to make sure that you continue to listen If your student provides information to you that's super unique, that's an opportunity to let law enforcement know of that information. I was use the swarm of bees as the the, reason that we're going into lockdown often when we're talking to kids because it's a little less scary, a little more relatable. And and it, it kind of avoids denial, right? This like, oh, it could never happen here. Well, we can all imagine that a swarm of bees could happen. And so I say, you know, if the the kid texts you that they saw the swarm of bees buzz by with a blue baseball cap on, then call law enforcement, right? Let us know that information as an ecosystem so that we have that data and we can then act on it. So again, all of that just comes from a a framing of the conversation up front. Parents can become our, our assets and our partners, or they can be a real challenge in the emergency response. 
Yeah, I had a school conversation last week uh, with the district that said, we want to institute a policy where we just take all the kids' phones and we want the teachers to take them. So I think, okay, you're locking rooms down and you're asking everybody to be quiet. And then you're going to ask a teacher to try to force out of the hands of people, including like teenagers, right. cell phones, that they're going to be dipping in their pockets and saying, I don't have a phone. I don't know what you're talking about. And it's going to turn into a discussion. And the same thing about the phone that might be in the hands of a fifth grader. And you have a 12-year-old who's got a phone who knows how to use it and has emergency text buttons for their mom and dad on there. And mom and dad are texting them and not getting any answer back. And what you're doing is forcing all the parents into panic mode coming to the schools because they can't reach their child, but they hear on the news that there's some sort of event going on at their kid's school or nearby. And where a parent might be able to say, hey, I hear there's something going on outside your school. Just follow the directions. Things are going to be okay. I love you. I'll see you after school. Being supportive and emotionally supportive to a child. Instead, you have parents who can't communicate with their kids. I think there's a little bit of resonating of, I never had to text my parents when I was in school. So that's great. That was yesterday. You know, you didn't have to ride to school in a buggy either, you know, and make sure that there was a good buggy whip available for the horse, right? That doesn't exist anymore. But we live in a different world that has phones, that has communications. Even if you take some kid's phone, he's probably wearing an Apple watch, you know, so you never know. And taking the phones creates a huge tumult inside of a classroom. And the school was like, well, we need to control all the messages. And I said, why do you want to take the phones? And they said, well, we need to make sure they're all turned off because that's the rule. Turn your phone off or turn the sound down because that'll distract the shooter. I'm thinking by the time you get all the phones and get them all off, the shooter will be gone. So here's a question for you based on your background. Do you meet with parents? I do. I mean, I, I'll do ideally a parent education session once a year with each school. And, you know, now that's my, part of my team's work, right? But we try to be the ones to provide that information because often it can add some credibility. And that that's maybe a good baseline recommendation for anybody listening. It I think that's have, true. Bring somebody in, let them talk to parents, let them say, the sky is not falling. We are safe today. Because yeah. it means a whole lot more coming from someone who has the expertise and credibility to, to say it meaningfully than coming yeah. from the school leader. That's true. I get a lot of calls just for that. It's like, I could tell them this, but if you come in and say it and you say the FBI says, and suddenly you bring credibility to the table. So bring whoever you can, but I would warn this, make sure they know what current best practices are. Because sometimes there are experts out there and I put air quotes around my word experts. They have very good marketing skills and they've done a great job of marketing their, their business. And that's fantastic but they may be teaching 10-year-old best practices. My problem is just the opposite. I spend all my time developing best practices and never developing enough business. <laughs> and I'm doing a free podcast. How smart is that? So business advice, don't take it from me. But non-business advice, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I'm there for you. So I'm cognizant of the fact that you know Sarah's not here at this moment, and I know that she would want to say, I have three kids. This is how Sarah would say it, except I can't say it with an English slash New Zealand accent. I'll hear it that she, way. <laughs> hear it in English slash New Zealand accent. I have three kids and it scares me to death sometimes when I think about them being in school. How do I deal with that? You know, I, I think that's the real moment that we all have to face at some point. And I would say a few things. One, you know, there are these low, the technical term for this is low frequency, high severity. The way I would put this for, for everybody to sort of appreciate is like, it's very unlikely. And if it does happen, it's a really big deal. We have these incidents, of course, a few times a year in any given country. And in some countries, maybe less than a few times a year. And to be clear, I'm not just talking about active shooter events at that, right? I'm talking about a major earthquake. I'm talking about a major fire. I'm talking about a major hurricane that affects people of drought, right? All of the different potential hazards and concerns. So we're going to have a few of those in any given country. And we're going to have a dozen or two of those across the world in any given year. And what we want to do is we want to be as prepared for those events. And we want our children to be as prepared for those events as they can possibly be. And so I would focus on first helping them manage denial, 
which is the beginning of every emergency, right? The yep. very first thing we're going to do is say, oh, this emergency could be happening, but nope, it's not that. The you know, A truck just drove by. I'm sitting in Los Angeles as we record this. Um, and so the thing we always think is, is that an earthquake? No, it was a truck that just drove by and it shook the building <laughs> a little bit. We got to break through that. We've got to stop that. We've got to start acting as though this is a real emergency earlier on. And so, and by the way, I know that that comes with consequence, right? I'm not saying that lightly, you know, when we potentially overreact to a car backfiring and think maybe that was an active shooter beginning, or we overreact to the truck driving by, all of those things do induce some trauma. In my work, I have to focus on what's going to kill you worst and what's going to kill you first. And so what I need to do is- Well, I love that. What's going to kill you worst? What's going to kill you first? I've never heard that before. (laughs) I love it. You know, what we've got to do is we've got to take the risk of overreacting. And honestly, I've made a decision that I would prefer to overreact a hundred times and have everybody be safe yep. and underreacting even once and have somebody not be safe as a result. And mm-hmm. so I've made that decision today. I'm going to default to progress. That's one of the big themes of the book is like, we've got to overcome this denial, you know, analysis, paralysis, et cetera. And I hope that everybody will join me in that decision, or at least many will, because the more people that take that early action, the more contagious effects that has, and the more other people around us will take that same early action. Whereas the more of us that stand passive, there was a, a study of this group that they brought in, they were, they were taking a test in a room, I think there were about 15 people, they started pushing smoke out in the corner of the room. And this group of people, of course, all you know test subjects, and so everybody was safe the whole time in reality. But what they should have thought was happening, what they did think was happening as they were surveyed after was that the room was catching fire or the next door room was catching fire and smoke was billowing into theirs. They didn't respond for over 20 minutes to that smoke billowing into the room. We have this kind of group think this like bystander effect, right? You hear it as different things. It, the bottom line is we've got to do more and more quickly. And so that's maybe the first step that I would say for you, for your kids, for for us as just individual people. I think the second piece is we've got to know that, you know, yes, there are scary things that happen in the world. There's no, there's no question, right? They're, they're arguably happening more frequently, especially if we lump all of the different hazards together. We look at the number of incidents that are occurring of, of major natural disasters, of human created incidents. We've got you know, war. We've got big stuff that's happening, right? I don't want to un- take away from that. And we are absolutely making progress at how we keep people safe. We're building better buildings. We're building better systems to be able to activate support when we need it. Those systems are being trained better, right? The EMS people who arrive know better how to handle a person who's been injured from smoke, from gunshots, from anything else that may be afflicting us. And so I'm not saying like trust in everything that's that's happening around us. I'm not saying, you know, trust blindly, especially but I am saying it's easy to get focused in on the scary stuff. And it's really easy to lose track of the progress that we're making as a society on making ourselves safer and making our capacity for response better. And so I think those are the two things I think of when somebody says to me, you know, what do I do with my kids? How do I feel comfortable dropping them off at school? I go, Look, they, they've got to go to school in order to develop their education, right? Their academic understanding, their role in the world, all those sorts of things. They've got to be there to develop the social connections and relationships that that they deserve and that you want for them to have. And so so take some comfort in helping them, educating them, managing that denial piece, and take some comfort in the, the quality of the progress that we're making as a country and as a world, really. You've heard this, I'm sure, your whole career we waited forever for the ambulance to arrive. You know, that how time travels in an emergency. Could you kind of address that for people who haven't seen the other side of it and how emergencies come together and the value of, you know, knowing ahead of time what's going to happen? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll maybe start with the like underlying principle for this, which is we have this idea that everybody's heard of the time value of money. And if you haven't, I'd encourage you to talk to your retirement planner and, and learn more about it. Uh, but- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a little advertisement there for your pension fund. Yeah. <laughs> the, the basic idea is a dollar today is, is worth more than that same dollar tomorrow because of inflation and opportunity cost and all this, all this stuff, right? 
And so, and by the way, that's the extent of what I know about the time value of money. So don't- Just why no one is to hire Chris as their accountant or financial manager. (laughs) But we've borrowed that concept and said that there's a time value of life, that an action taken at the beginning of the emergency is more valuable than that same action taken a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours later. And there are tons of ways that this has implications, right? From denial, how quickly can we move through denial to take action? Um, to the the question that you just asked, which is like, okay, so I dial nine one one. Well, let's even go a step back. The there was an interesting study that was published pre COVID, where somebody went to dial nine one one on their cell phone, and so you know, I I guess we shouldn't promote a specific phone, but you can imagine there's a a phone that has little circles on it. You dial nine one one. You would think that that's a really quick number to dial. It's three digits. You hit the green button that says call. You've made a thousand calls in your lifetime, probably many more than that. You would think that it would be so easy. It turns out it takes most people an average of 22 seconds to just get that call to go through. Now, I can tell you, I can pick up the phone and dial 911. In fact, you maybe don't hit the green button, but anybody listening could practice this, right? And that's actually what it takes to make that faster, to go from 21, 22 seconds down to three or four seconds, is we've got to practice it. Because if we don't, we inadvertently dial 411 or 811 or 800 or you know our local area code. And especially if you live in an area where you have like a 9-1 as your area code, you may end up dialing zero because that's the, the rest of the area code as opposed to dialing 911. So my point is, at the very beginning, you are the opportunity to accelerate. Well, then you get on the phone with 911, you start talking to a dispatcher, and the dispatcher is going to give you some support. They're going to say things like, what's going on? Where are you? And part of their job is to get information from you so that they can send the right resources and make sure that the resources are safe and go to the right part of the buildings and all those sorts of things. But also part of their job is to help you start helping the person or helping the scene. And so if you're in a medical emergency, they may say something like, you know, can you check to see if the person is breathing? Can you shake them or, or tap their shoulders? Here, so I can be that person on the phone, right? These are the kind of, sometimes the calls come in and they're like this, just send an ambulance, just send an ambulance, just send an ambulance. Why aren't you sending an ambulance? <laughs> Wait, I, you need to tell me where, right? And that yeah. actually is what happens. So all of those conversations are going to take a couple of minutes. And actually, they're going to start sending resources somewhere in the 30 to 60 second mark, as long as you provide your address quickly enough. But then they're going to continue conversation with you. And one of the things we always say is like, let 911 hang up first. Often, depending on the area you're in, things are getting busy now, but often they'll stay on with you until the fire department or police department or others arrive. And then what also has to happen is, and and I know this is kind of tough to hear, but your EMS professionals, your fire department folks, like they're, they're not always sitting at the driver's seat of the ambulance waiting to come to your location. They may be at the gym, they may be at lunch. If it's overnight, they may be asleep, right? All of those things. And and that's necessary because they work 24, 48, 72, 96 hour shifts all the time. And so they've got a shoot time, it's called. So they're going to make their way to their vehicles, get dressed, do whatever they need to do. That's going to take anywhere from 20 to 60 seconds. And there's different rules depending on where you are, but but generally figure that's a good estimate. And they've got to drive to you. My favorite, favorite story is I was driving at our ambulance this is a long time ago, and it was before the cell phone law came out, I think, that said that we couldn't hold our phones in California and talk on the phone, that we had to use you know, earphones or whatever. And so I was driving code three, lights and sirens are on, and, and the rule is when you get to an intersection, you have to blare the horn and all that kind of stuff. And so I was doing that in the left turn lane, planning to go straight through. And I looked to my right to clear the intersection, and there's a guy on the phone next to me in his car, phone to the ear, and he looks over at me and he put he puts his finger up. You can't see, but he but he does the shh thing, right? Because because your ambulance was making too much noise for his phone call. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sad. Yeah. Oh, oh. This yeah. is not a best practice in case you were thinking about huh? <laughs> just to be clear. Please do not. It, it, right, but they're going to have to manage and battle reality on the way from wherever they are, their station, their their last call, the hospital, wherever they might be, to you. And it's those sorts of people, concerns, sources of friction, I'll call it, to stay diplomatic, that they'll have to run past or manage around in order to get to you. And so in general, it's four to six minutes of driving, even with a light and siren, it doesn't do nearly as much good as we think to have that 
There's still traffic, there's still stuff. And so all of that's going on. And then by the way, once they get to you, especially if you're in a school, they have to figure out how to actually get to you, right? So they get to the front gate, but where are you? Are you in a classroom? Are you in the art room? Are you in the back field? Are you in the gym? And that can take another minute or two. And so, you know, I ask people to prepare for the first seven minutes from the onset of the emergency to the expected arrival of your first first responders. I like people to assume it's going to be seven minutes. Might it be faster? Of course. Might it be slower? Absolutely. But that's a good benchmark to say, I can handle the first seven minutes and at least help the situation get a little bit better. So that's things like CPR training or stop the bleed training. It's things like being confident enough to initiate the lockdown. And so we've got to get 911 on the way in order to make sure that if it's a heart attack and becomes worse, that they're already on the way and that those minutes are passing in parallel, right? The patient is getting worse, but also the paramedics are getting closer. We want to run those two things in parallel as much as we possibly can. You are not expected to be calm, cool, and collected like you see on Grey's Anatomy when we show up, because we assume that we're there on one of your worst days. And so allow yourself to be a human, allow yourself to, you know, to cry if you need to cry, to, you know, if you need to raise your voice to get a point across, you know, ideally do it as nicely as you can do. So allow yourself to be human, but answer the questions that we ask, because we will have a lot of them. And all, every single question has a purpose and will help the person who's being treated get better treatment, both from us and when we get them to the hospital, assuming that's where we go. Good patients and bad patients? Generally, who's a good patient? Good patients tend to be people who can answer questions and will answer questions. And bad patients? People who are combative, people you would think that if you dialed 911, you wouldn't try to assault the 911 providers who respond. Yeah. Turns out that's not always true. Um, oh, my. So, those sorts of things. And also, patients who, you know, maybe can make our jobs a little bit easier, right? If you can get to the door, if it's practical and the dispatcher allows you to do that go ahead, right? I'm not saying if you have a broken leg, you should drag yourself there. But if you're, you know, calling because you know have a, a splinter, and we get those calls, right? And that's not a bad thing. Make the call if you need to. But if you can get to the door, well, that makes the call that much faster, that puts us back in service that much faster. And now we can go help the next person that much faster, we can become available. And so the more you can work with us, the more grateful we are for it. So I appreciate all this, and I know it's way far afield from what you guys do every day. Can you tell our audience a couple of things? One is remind them again about the book, and can you tell them about you know your company and you know kind of what it provides? Not because we're shilling companies and books, but because I think people don't necessarily know where the resources are. So what kind of things do people get? in your particular company, because I think it's a very kind of unique format. Could you just explain that before we go? Absolutely. Yeah. So the book is All Clear, Lessons from a Decade Managing School Crises. And it's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and all the other places that you would expect. And if you have bulk orders or you want to do anything like that, feel free to reach out. I can help connect you to folks to do that. Our company, though, it, you know, it, it is three branches. And basically, the center of the organization is our thought leadership. And we call that our learning and management practice. And in that organization, we have emergency management consultants who go out and help schools and events prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. And that's all inclusive, right? So it's A, it's all hazards, meaning all emergencies. But B, that means that we'll come in at the beginning of the year and do a training for your staff and faculty. It means we'll do CPR training for you, all those sorts of things. We actually will write the plan for you, not, not just the emergency plan, but like what should the school accomplish over the next three, five, seven years in and around safety and security? And then we can actually quarterback that plan for you. And so that's what that team does. And then there's also a crisis response element to that team. So you know, we do respond after major emergencies occur and often to, to schools that we've not worked with before, but sometimes to schools we have, and we'll support the community through that. That was something I saw come up in the, the Oxford after action. Um, I saw the, the value of sort of external crisis leadership supporting right. the recovery process. Yeah. A non-ending discussion that I have with people. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's two other branches. They're both staffing elements, but on the one side, we'll provide physical security. And so that's your security officers. Today, unarmed. In the future, we'll be adding armed. We're figuring out exactly what time frame that'll be. Not in the next year, I can tell you that. 
And then we also have a health component because we think there is a, obviously there was a boom for our health component during COVID, but we think there's a long-term challenge for the healthcare industry just because of generational trends. And this is something I talk about a lot, but you know, we're seeing this increase in the number of aging folks across the US. We're seeing a decrease in the number of people who want to become healthcare providers and healthcare professionals arguably inspired by COVID. And arguably, there are others who were motivated into the field, right? So we'll leave it to the sociologists to figure out in hindsight. But for right now, you know, what we're concerned about is we won't have enough healthcare providers in the country to serve the number of people we have in the country over the next 10 years. And so we're working to build out our core of healthcare providers by placing them in schools, providing support and giving an alternate to a traditional school nurse in many cases, if not an additive to a traditional school nurse. So Chris, how old is your company? We are about 15 years old. So you started this company when you were 12, it looks like, looking at your face. So very innovative. But the concept, I think, is something that is much of what we talk about in this podcast, which is look at your whole picture, pick a part of it, improve it, look at the whole picture, pick another part, improve it. And I think that's one of the things that I always found interesting about your company, intriguing about the concept of what, not even so much the company, but you personally, and why I wanted to just have you on today is just an opportunity to say here, you know, if you think you're the only one who thinks globally about a problem, here's somebody else who does it. And here's how he's figured out how to do it and make the world a better place. And so for that, I thank you. Thank you. And truly, the the organization at this point, I mean, we're guided by advisors like you. And so I'm grateful for the ability to both be in the work and also be fueled and fed by the the thought leadership that you do day in and day out. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. That's why we make all the big bucks we make as uh, as advisors. Any parting uh, words for our parents, business owners, teachers, administrators? It, it, it almost echoes what you just shared, but I'll, I'll say what I often do, which is you know, I'm a marathoner and, and so I've spent a lot of time just focused on the very next step. Uh, and, and I actually think that that translates directly to this work. It is overwhelming if you look at the whole pie, the whole puzzle, whatever, however you want to think about it. But if you focus on just the very next step, you can always, always make that. And if you can't, take a smaller step. And so I hope that you'll focus on the next step and, and, and then focus on the step after that. I love that. As Sarah would say, end scene. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And if you want to know more, Catherine's book, Stop the Killing, is out now. For more details, go to katherineschweit.com. Please consider also supporting our independently made podcast. It's simple to do. Go to Patreon dot com forward slash stop the killing and for as little as the price of a latte a month you can be part of the solution to stop the killing patreon rewards range from official do-gooder status to ad-free episodes autographed books and opportunities to connect with us directly for your business school church or even just a book club chat but just knowing that you are part of a movement that has the power to make your community safer, well, that's got to taste better than a skinny cappuccino any day. So please head to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing now and polish off your do gooder halo and make sure to include your name so we can give you a shout out. This podcast is a community podcast production. That's con with an N. If you want more content, then head over to Community Podcast at Instagram, where you'll find trailers on more binge-worthy true crime, like the award-winning podcast Conning the Con. And check out our show notes for all the links mentioned. Finally, if you want one takeaway action that you can do right now that can help make our community safer, Please share, rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Everybody needs to know that they hold the keys to see something and say something. Together, we can stop the killing. It's one of those things you hope never happens, but you better train for it. Because it will happen. And it will happen in places you wouldn't expect. Be ready for it.